thanks to God for um, the opportunity we have to meet and discuss this most important subject for the life of our community and all the Orthodox communities in this country and beyond. I'm very encouraged to see how many of you have turned out. That shows that this is something that is also close to your thoughts. It is part of our Orthodox tradition wherever we go and which land we live. First, to set up an old, an Orthodox Christian church to worship the Orthodox But also, to set up a school. It's a long standing tradition so that we give the best to our children. And the best we can give is knowledge and experience of the love of God, knowledge of the love of God, experience of His love. Everything else can tell us of this. Out of love of God, out of Christian life in Christ, then through education, through learning, which could be helpful, healthy, well worth and take. It is our desire to start the Orthodox Christian school, a full-time school, in this community with a strong Greek Orthodox element. We've had a very successful Greek school. We also have a very successful Sunday school. Our other classes meet with teach Christian Orthodox subjects. But we felt now is the time to have a full time school for all our children, since our community is not bound or tied up to one particular ethnic background, but our community wants to be, and I believe it is, the church, what <laughs> is the kingdom of God as much as it can be realized on earth which encompasses and embraces every person who seeks to worship God in Trinity and accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as the Orthodox Church teaches. So we want to have a full-time school in English, but also some other languages to be taught. And as it is our model, our school, we hope to provide excellence in education with an Orthodox Christian ethos. I believe that this is not just a desire, a mature uh, request for the Orthodox Christians, but generally for in the wider society. I hear from people from outside the Orthodox Church, other Christians, and even sometimes non-Christians, who want to have a school with such ethos. We are not against any other than dead Lord. We are for Christian education. And we want to do our best to provide it. I'm very blessed to have in this community and in other communities people with wonderful expertise and zeal. Presbyteria Thalia, Dr. Potini, and others have great zeal and they have researched the subject. And they have found out, as you will see by the down, how practically it can be implemented, realistic, that it is well. Yes, it is very, I would say, ambitious and has difficulties and risks, but it is doable. It has happened elsewhere with great success. Why not here? Short address last Sunday. I mentioned the example of the Orthodox Christian School in London, growing St. Cyprian's Orthodox Christian School. It is obviously manifestly an Orthodox Christian school. When you enter it, you see the icon of the Lord. Children start the day with prayers, Orthodox Christian prayers. And then they are given excellence in education. Very good teachers from the teaching profession that have been employed. The, the success of the school is obvious in the numbers of the children. When I last visited it, we had 500 children in the sponsor in the school. 
And although when this school was organized by the Greek Orthodox at the Diocese of Thyatira, a small minority of the children were Greeks, some a few more greater, bigger minority were Orthodox. The majority of children were not Orthodox Christians. About a third or more were Muslim. And that was very surprised. How 500 children, some of them Orthodox, others were non-Orthodox Christians, and some non-Christians were all singing together, Christ is risen, Christos and Estia Necron. It was Pascal video. And I asked the headmistress, and she said, parents choose to send their children to an Orthodox Christian school for the values that we have at home. They don't mind if this is not the religion which is professed here, but they like the ethos, the culture, the values that we have. So I believe that this could have an appeal to the wider community. But let us start with our own children. And my colleagues here have done very, as I said, thorough work. They have consulted specialists on the subject, and you will be, I think you will be pleased with the results of their work. And one needs prayer. We will not achieve it with God's help. If the Lord wants it, it will happen. If it's not blessed, it will not And may our prayer be the prayer that Father John, our spiritual father, asked people to pray about a big project. He said, pray to God if it is his will to, for us to achieve it. If it is not his will to stop it. Because sometimes the Lord allows for us to do what, what our will wants, so that we learn the hard way. So we pray, Lord, if it is your will, let it be done. Help us to do it. If it is not your will, show us that we will stop. May I read now the letter which His Eminence, our Archbishop Nikita, has sent in response to a request to have it. His endorsement. Dear Presbyter Sanya, Dr. Fotini Havlova, Catherine Helms. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I have received your letter dated 8th January 2024, and I'm both humbled and delighted to learn of the significant and inspiring endeavor you have undertaken. The establishment of the first Christian Orthodox primary school in Scotland. It is with deepest of gratitude to God that I acknowledge your commitment to nurturing the spiritual and academic growth of our young Orthodox Christians. Your dedication to providing an environment where our children can receive a holistic education is commendable and sets an example for everyone to imitate. I wholeheartedly endorse your efforts and the mission of the school, which seeks to instill in our youth a strong foundation in the Orthodox Christian faith while offering a high standard of academic education. The prospect of a unique classical curriculum that integrates the best elements of various educational philosophies is indeed exciting and aligns well with our Orthodox value. The presence of experienced and enthusiastic teachers who share your vision is a true blessing, and I pray that their dedication and wisdom will guide our young learners to the path of faith, knowledge, and virtue. I am pleased to offer my support and blessings to St. Agnes Orthodox Church School in Edinburgh. Your desire to place the school under the protective wings of our archdiocese is a testament to your commitment to preserving the truth and Orthodox ethos in education. May the Lord bless your endeavors abundantly, guiding and protecting your steps as you embark on this sacred mission. Your labor in his vineyard is an inspiration to all, and I have every confidence that, with his grace, St. Andrew's Orthodox Church School will flourish and become a beacon of faith, 
knowledge, Christian love. Let's go. With my paternal blessings, prayers, and deep, deep appreciation for your dedication to the Orthodox faith and education, I remain Nikitas as Bishop of the Arthur and Great Britain. We're very grateful to His Eminence for His support. But may I emphasize here yeah. that though the school will be under the spiritual guidance of the Archbishop, the spiritual oversight and authority, however, the school will be open to all of its Christians of all communities, and we are all we see it as a the common endeavor, regardless of our jurisdictional ties, regardless of where we live. So this is a common effort by all those Christians and others who want to join us. Thank you very much, and I wish you all and our endeavor to have the blessing of God and to be successful and fruitful. May this day be a historic day. Scotland, for the Christian education in Scotland and beyond. And may we in our own effort help to reverse the tide of de-Christianization of society because this understanding that people are leaving Christ is in some way a delusion. There are lots more people than we know that need Christ, they just need encouragement. People who seek the faith, who want to remain Christians, but they don't have a unified, coordinating force, and they're not encouraged. When we speak about the Lord, that show the signs of the faith in the wider community, we saw a very moving response from unexpected comments. Let us all work for this end, to remind Scotland that it is Christian, as for those Christians, our vision is to raise our children in truth and to see them become the saints for the glory of God. Therefore, our mission as parents and educators is to empower them to achieve their full potential, both spiritually and academically. To achieve that, our aim is to set up the first Christian Orthodox primary school in Scotland, with God's help always. For this purpose, we are here today to present you the uniqueness of our school and to invite you to contribute to the development of this school by registering your interest both from parents, volunteers, prospective staff, and any donors present. We need to gather information on the numbers, ages, and location of prospective students to fairly formulate a detailed business plan. This will look into how many classes we need, how many teachers and other staff, what sort of a building we need, and where it should it be ideally placed. Whether there is a need for a school bus, for example, what is the overall cost of brown such a school, what are our fundraising values, whether we're going to need school fees and how big they will be. All this data will be then submitted to the registrar of independent students' holder for approval. The application for registration is already in progress and will be completed only after the school is fully set up. For this reason, the registration is the final goal of our plan. How the school will be able to operate immediately afterwards. The school will be an independent and charitable school. For this purpose, we have applied to the Scottish Child Replay, and we are awaiting for the final appeal it. The charity will be run by a board executive committee who will receive input from specialist advisors, parents of the school, and invited to become members of the charity, as well as anyone else interested in this project. Let me introduce you to our team so far. As you always have here, and this is Raptor of Ilion and the team of priests in this community. And then we have Dr. Formi Hantima, uh, who has a knowledge degree in education and a doctorate in Socratic education. 
is a mother of four, trustee of our charity, and head of the curriculum development, and can help us become equal to the apostles, just like he said. Then we have Kathleen Jameson, who is a veteran surgeon, uh, dedicated mother of three, trustee and secretary of our charity so far, and we can provide all the food and drinks for the event today. Thank you, God. Then is myself and Christina Vasilika, uh, that's in French, who is also a presenter and mother of one, and works in the IT sector with a Bachelor in International Business and a Master in Information Systems Development. Finally, we have Nadine Razi, who is the principal teacher of Moray Council with over 25 years' experience in the education, education sector, with a master's degree in education, leadership, and bilingualism. A postgraduate diploma in additional support for learning for the bio in Berlin and the Bachelor of Arts and Education, and is also a fire three. Then we have our specialist advisors, uh, Anka, who has years of experience as an early years practitioner and even runs her own nursing and supported us from the very beginning. We have Rhea, who is a very talented teacher with invaluable experience has been giving her time acting as an advisor for arts regional development. We have Mr. Randy Brown, who is a retired chief inspector of the Scopus Police, who is helping all the PFC development in safeguarding fire safety canals. And we also have Sophronia, who will read the music lesson. Uh, amongst us as well are some future teachers like Fimba and Jeremy. Uh, who are very eager uh, to apply further qualifications to come and join uh, our school. The school will start with students one week Saturday from 8.30 until 3, like all schools, across all subjects areas, and will ensure that they to check services when available. Initially, it will cater to students aged 5 to 12 years old, to also include focus on tasks. And our aim is that throughout the coming years it will expand into a full primary and secondary school for accommodating all ages globally. All the teachers will be fully registered with the general teaching house of Scotland and have a membership with the PDG scheme, the Detecting Vulnerable Forming Scheme. GOP has already sent the teachers who are enthusiastic about our very experience and fully qualified. And the chest about our orthodox eagles and we meet the Nabil Nazi and after the presentation for the meeting. Here's what we need in my papers. Thank you, Brother. First, let me say thank you so much. I'm very grateful to see that so many people are interested uh, in school and they're all here. And and to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to speak to you about the academics of the school. Okay, I'm going to start by thanking you for being out of the room. Over the past few decades, and particularly over the past few years, we've seen the state educational system in Scotland develop along lines that, as Christians, we're not having. We've seen a combination of neural incline in the academic standard with the introduction of different ideologies that don't sit well with a Christian way of thinking. And ideologies that we're seeing are antithetical to Christian anthropology. So that just means that we essentially have a different understanding of what a person is, what it means for a person to flourish, and therefore what are the aims of education. And we feel that schools can be better, and we're all here today because we want to offer our children the best possible education an education that will nourish their souls alongside their minds. We're not about alone to think that there is a need to open Christian schools. We can see at least in the UK and in the United States that there are several Christian schools that are opening over the past couple of years, and many of them are opened by Orthodox parishes, but also other ones. And I mean, we've been in consultation with some of these schools, and we are learning as much as we can from their experience for setting up the school. If you look at the history of education, you'll see that what we're doing here today is not a new thing. Almost all the schools that now exist were originally opened as Christian institutions learning very many years ago. 
even though most of these have lost their Christian character over time. So if you like, you could say that this prism that we're gathered here for today is part of a current movement by Christians to take the education of children back into hand and to restart Christian school. But having said that, we don't want a school for our kids that is just Christian. We want them to have the best possible way of understanding. And this is what I want to underline. I want this to be the one thing that you take away from my presentation today. So we're now just huddling together in the church and raising our kids today together because we're scared of the outside world. We're here because we're confident that we can offer something that is better. So our model for the school, as you can see here, is an excellent education, an excellent classical education with an orthodox ethos. So the education at St. Anne's Orthodox Church Primary School will offer an excellent, making it excellent has been a priority for us. We've put a lot of effort into bringing the best elements from various pedagogies to compose and create enough that I hope that we can convince you by the end of today, surpasses the standard model. Our school will offer the nourishing and truthful Christian environment that every child deserves to grow up with, but at the same time, we are striving to provide our children with the best possible academic. So in my presentation today, I want to unpack this a little for you. What to have me speak about an excellent education, and what is it that will make the school great? I never possibly go into deep pleasure with you about all the wonders that allow them to work for you now. We've put together an exciting program on all of the subjects. We've created a website where you can find out more about what we want to teach in each subject. And I invite you to read the website, and you're welcome to ask me specifically about any topic that you want to know more about afterwards in the discussion or at any other time that you can find me. But for now, I would just aim to give you an overall understanding of what our intended curriculum is about. I will go into a few details that should give you a feeling for our probe, how we solve some of the problems that standard schools are having. Afterwards, we can have a discussion about it, and I invite you to raise your questions, your concerns, your comments, to help us improve our model even more. So I'm going to tell you something about the pedagogies that we use and our chosen methodologies. So that means what we're going to teach, why we're going to teach it, and how we're going to teach it. But you will notice that we will be in classical school. Our curriculum is essentially a classical curriculum. And I will explain what this means shortly. Our curriculum also draws mainly from these six pedagogical approaches. I'm not going to tire you by explaining each one of these. And you can find out more about them on our website. But I will say something about the classical Quran as it forms the foundation of our school's program. And then I will give you an example of how we would teach mathematics. And this should hopefully show you how it's happening this various approaches work together in one is. The, class the classical curriculum model is a rather rigorous system of education that is content heavy, while at the same time it is a very joyful program. It gets its name from the fact that it aims to correct some of the shortcomings of modern schooling. That means the progressive education that has been evolving since roughly the 20th century. And it does that by looking back at the best elements of schooling throughout history. The classical education movement has a stellar approach to education that has ran from the days of classical Greece through Roman and medieval times and up until the major modernizations took place in the 1950s. So in other words, it is held that someone like C.S. Lewis received an education that was very similar to the people of the education that all of the U.S. became thing of the past were receiving. In a significant sense, it was similar. And that type of education ended with the progressive movement of the 20th century. So one of the changes that classical educators have taken issue with is the shift away from learning knowledge. It is considered that a person needs to know enough facts about the world so as to form a correct view of the world so that they can then think reasonably about subjects. <laughs> Modern school systems have generally made a shift the way from learning facts towards issues of well-being, life skills, and higher order skills. As a parent, you may have noticed that children enjoy going to school, but that they don't learn very much about anything while they're there. So higher order skills, where are they? They're just things like critical thinking, the evaluation of ideas, comprehension, which just means understanding things deeply, analyzing information and more. And your lower order skills are things like memorizing and recalling. So personal education, of course, agrees that these are good skills to have, these higher order skills. But you cannot, however, do these skills properly without first having a foundation of true knowledge 
and the lower orders. So you have to know things. You have to have a correct view of the facts about your subject matter. You need to be able to recall them. And then you can apply this world that you have in your life and engage with the higher order skills. So a person, for example, cannot think critically about how to solve the environment and environmental problem if they have not for significant knowledge and understanding of the relevant facts. So if a child tries to have an opinion without having proper knowledge, then they're not actually thinking critically, they're only imitating the opinions of others. So classical education gives children knowledge about the world and trains children in the lower order skills so that as they grow, they can truly realize their capacity for higher order skills. It is a system of education that is content heavy. In effect, what this means is that it is a system of education that is designed using various methods to teach children a decent amount of serious content. So the classical system considers that there are three stages to learning. So each stage corresponds to a cha uh, stage in the child's development. The idea is that young children are interested primarily in learning what is true about their world that they find themselves in. They're good at soaking up facts, they're great at memorizing information, and they want to know how everything works. This is the grammar stage, and it lasts up to roughly the age of nine or 10. At this early stage, children form much of their worldview, that is, their impression of what is. Education in the grammar stage makes the most of the skills and interests that children naturally exhibit to equip them with the ground of thought. And that's why it's called the grammar stage. It gives them a foundation of knowledge in each subject studied. As children grow, they start to ask why and how. They enter the logic stage, which is otherwise known as the dialectic stage. Their education evolves into identifying connections and distinctions between ideas. It is a time when children grow in understanding. They focus on thinking, reasoning, and analyzing. By the time they reach this point, they have the grammar, well fixed in their minds that they can draw on it. The logic stage occurs roughly between the ages of 10 and 14, and this is followed by the rhetoric stage, which brings children to the end of their schooling at the age of 18. So as a primary school, we're concerned primarily with the grammar stage and the beginning of the logic stage. Primary school is a time when children learn, they observe, they remember, and they're always growing in knowledge. We give our children over and over again, teaching about the natural world, in nature studies, maths, and science, and the human world, like history, geography, art, language, and so on. In the history class, for example, the classical system teaches the past in a chronological order and gives children a timeline to learn by heart. This gives the learners <coughs> the context for placing every instance of history that they learn about. It helps them to see the greater narrative of history. So the details, that is the particular moments of history, are studied within the context of it all. The details work together to make an overview, and the overview gives context to each detail. So this approach ensures that children are not just learning random, floating, and effectively useless fact bits. Instead, they're learning the parts of the whole. Knowledge of facts is properly ordered to support understanding. So the classical school often uses curriculum cycles. This means that students study a program of content that runs over two or three years. And then they repeat that same content again after they've completed the cycle. So in history, for example, our school would use a three-year cycle. In the first year, in the first year of the cycle, they would learn about ancient history. In the second year, they learn about medieval and modern world history. And in the third year, they learn about local Scottish and British history. So children study these in primary one to three, and each cycle corresponds to a year. They memorize songs and they become familiar with stories. We study them again in those same periods in primary four and six. And this time we're going to greater depth and understanding with these topics that they're already familiar with. They also have the opportunity to revise their history and memorize. And then again in primary seven, they study one of the cycle years yet again, this time of throwing a new set of study skills. So the cyclical approach develops steps of understanding and ensures that children will remember what they have learned. So there's no point of making effort to study something once and then to let it slip into the rubbish bin for long. Another characteristic of the classical education at the primary school level, the grammar stage, is that it uses a lot of memorizing and recalling. Important facts are committed to memory. Students memorize a large number of key facts by learning little rhymes or songs. So music makes it enjoyable and it makes it easy to learn the facts by heart. It also helps the students to retain the memory and to recall it later. 
So this lower order skill is practiced in the early years and bears fruit in a child's further learning. So classical education is not merely concerned with creating a knowledgeable human being. It strives to support the growth of the whole person towards being a fulfilled, wise, happy person and an able, virtuous member of society. Education has an important role to play in bringing forth a person's full potential. And classical education takes this responsibility very seriously. It is the aim at the heart of the classical system of learning. Classical school is designed to bring out the best of students. And the method that it uses to achieve this is to give the best to the child. So you bring out the best in a person by bringing the best to them. So the curriculum brings the learner face to face with what is good, honorable, and inspiring in history, in the sciences, and the discoveries that people have made in God's creation. Concerning nature, children study the awesomeness of creation, whilst, of course, pointing to what is most magnificent, the creator. Regarding humanity also, children immerse themselves in the study of the best art, the best music, the most excellent literature. Children study the great works of humanity, seeing the best of what people before have made, high quality work, and excellence become an educational method to inspire excellence in the learnings. They study the great heroes in history, and of course, in an Orthodox Christian school like her own, they come to know the lives of the saints very well. This is not to stay, say that the study of history is sugar-coated to make it beautiful, to make it nice. Truth is a fundamental value of a proper education. <clears throat> so students also learn about the tragedies and the mistakes that humans have made, such as wars and the oppressive use of their fellow humans. The classical school system is like an apprenticeship. It places the learner where they can observe the great events and the people of the past so that they can be inspired by their good deeds and learn from their mistakes. Having said this, we can now understand the motto of the classical education movement and unfold so beer. The true, the good, and the beautiful. That's the motto of classical education. So the classical school of truth is a child to what humans have been, to what we have come to know, and it apprentices them in what is best there. It wants to create a person who understands the world, who aims upwards, and who can be inspired by the people of the past and learn from their mistakes. By this point, you might be wondering if the classical curriculum will be too hard, or even if all this memorizing will be boring. It is a rigorous program of study. It gives a lot to the learner and it expects a lot from them. It respects the student as a creation of God. The school does not teach the students to waste their time. The person is capable of wonderful achievements but they are not reached with unsustained effort. All this, however, is done in an age-appropriate way. So the study is interesting, it is serious, and it is joyous. We use quite a lot of music and stories throughout to teach the content. Children love to hear stories. They love to know about events that happen in the lives of their parents and their grandparents. The classical school, in a sense, tells the narrative of our ancestors, of our societies, about their actions, their thoughts, and their discoveries. We also use quite a lot of happy games to revise the code. At our school, we have chosen to follow the classical curriculum because, as you can see, it is perfectly compatible with Christianity. You might think that a rigorous school program means this dense material that you don't have enough time to understand, and at the end of the day, there are these difficult tests, and everything is about performing. But the classical curriculum is locked out. It uses repetition and the joy of music to achieve depth. And we emphasize quite a lot that it is a school in the proper sense of the word. So the word school comes from scolando, which means actually stop working. To go to school and essentially stop. So then you have time and peace for us to observe and learn. So that is to be, be still and, and see the world. Yeah. And as I said, we take this classical curriculum and we are now to the needs to our needs of our school by bringing in elements from these other categories. What does all this look like? I'm going to try to show you what this will look like by telling you, giving you a little bit of an example of what our math class will look like. Mathematics is a subject that students need to be taught systematically. You need to go through the content in a certain order. You need to build up your understanding of the concepts, and you need to practice the skills involved regularly. So we start every day with the math. That's the program on the schedule. 
We start every day with math as the first subject, while our students are still fresh. And so the reasons mentioned, the first part of the, each lesson, the students work their way through a textbook. So this ensures that the children will follow a public progression in their studies, and it ensures that they will have the regular practice required uh, to acquire mathematical literacy, both the understanding of concepts and applied skills. We're looking to use textbooks with a Singaporean style syllabus. The National Level Math Mathematical Curriculum of Singapore has been acknowledged internationally as the best. It's been performing, it's been ranking as number one most successful course for primary study worldwide for the past three decades. And due to its exceptional results, the method has been imitated widely in the West already, so we will be following that tradition. But I want to draw your attention to the second half of the daily lessons that go beyond the textbook study and give each student a rich and positive personal relationship to mathematics, what makes our school valid. So in line with the classical learning philosophy that characterized our school, this section is dedicated to revealing to students the beauty of mathematics, the simple, the clear, and awe inspiring descriptions of truth that mathematics is uniquely capable of. Furthermore, we applaud maths to make the math class engaging and fun so that the children will desire of their own effort to understand the subject matter. The monthly class gives time for children to make free use of educational mathematical games. Primary one to three children will have the opportunity to manipulate a choice of tactile teaching games. These are called manipulatives. And then just things like, I brought a couple of examples here. They're just ways of visualizing different mathematical concepts where they exist. Here are some. The older children in primary four and seven will have a choice of board games, mathematical board games that they can play with their classmates. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, children will use part of the class to memorize basic mathematical facts through music. They will use song to memorize the times table, the squares, the cubes, metric measurements, significant laws such as associative, commutative, distributive, identity, and so on. And in this section, children will use the joy of music to memorize items that are above their level. This will act as foundation for further learning. When they come to need these, they will already have learned from my heart, and thus they will be ready to apply them with ease. So a good example that you might know of this from your own life is two-year-olds learning now. As part of this section, we will use games to revise the content that's been memorized. An example of a game would be where the students separate into two teams, and the players take turns answering a question. And if you answer the question correctly, then it's your turn to shoot the ball at a target and gain points for your team. Another example is that we could use musical chairs, where the kids are running around, and then that way you find who's going to answer what question. So you're bringing games into it. These games make the classroom more kinetic. That means moving around. They introduce a playable competitiveness, team spirit, and group motivation to the learning experience. Loosely, this is an approach called game education. The Wednesday class gives time to learn about important mathematicians of the past and great mathematical discoveries, beautiful solutions that have marked the history of mathematics, such as the Pythagorean theorem, and introduction to fun and solve puzzles. If you, for example, tell a child that you can win a million pounds if you solve the gold mile conjecture, then they sit up and want to know what pronouns are. Additionally, students study basic questions of philosophy on Wednesday, and they discuss questions such as what constitutes proof and in what ways maths represents reality. The Wednesday class takes the form of the conversation and engages learners in wider context for seeing what this hill in mathematics contributes to the world. It gives them an experience of the purposes of mathematics. And in this way, it grounds their study of numerous skills. So in conversation with the children, ideas and histories are presented and children are encouraged to explore these through them. Additionally, we use a type of Socratic questioning to teach new material. So the idea is that children, and all people in general, understand the answer better after the orders of the question. When we approach new data with a question in mind, we're far more able to absorb and make use of the data. Asking questions achieves two necessary processes. It focuses our attention, and it provides us with a framework with which we can order and make sense of creating. The simple way to understand the power of questions to motivate us to consider the the scheme of an engaging movie or an engaging novel. 
So the first and the longest part of a film is dedicated to involving the viewer in the problem. Here's the problem that needs to be solved. Time. Alien yeah. and species is going to come to Earth. And here's why it matters, because when they take over, they're going to destroy the agriculture and they're going to eat all the humans. We're all going to die. So by this point, the viewer has understood why the hero must take the action to address this issue, and the viewer is unable to appreciate all the actions that the hero takes to finally press this one button and shut down this one machine. We use questions in our classroom in the same way, at key turning points to introduce our learners to new solutions. An example of this comes after children have understood addition. So we can ask, what if I want to add three and three and three and three many times? What would be a more efficient way to write or compute this? After the children have had happened to me to answer this question as a group, then they are ready to understand the essence of addition and multiplication. You can also ask, what is the opposite of an operation? And allow children to derive subtraction from addition and division from their knowledge of multiplication. In later stages, you can ask students, what happens if you divide things that don't divide me? What happens if you apply addition or multiplication to things that are not numbers? You discover sets and Boolean logic. So you allow children to discover as a team before you present to the mathematical processes for what they really are. They are solutions to a dilemma. A great way for children to understand the process of mathematical discovery is to give them opportunities to experience what happens when you embrace the rules. You discover new branches of mathematics. So after children have a solid foundation understanding of how the rules work, they can see the joy of bringing them. So an example of this, of a rule, is that you can add any two numbers, but you can only subtract a smaller number from a larger number. So you can take away three from five, but you can't subtract six from five. So what happens if you break this rule? You discover negative numbers. This Socratic way of teaching achieves two of our purposes. Children are engaged to focus more keenly on new material, but also they come to see how everything in mathematics is connected. They understand the generalization element that makes patterns and in turn makes mathematical mathematics beautiful. Children can deeply understand that addition is a generalization of counting, and multiplication is a sort of addition. Exponentiation is repeated multiplication and so on. So finally, I want to point out to you an important element of gamifying learning in the classroom, using games to motivate. Games make the learning less individualistic. They harness the child's desire to be part of a community and to contribute to it with their neighbor. So each child can improve the learning of the community with their own achievement. The example of a relay race game Used for a vision illustrates this well. So you can have a relay race in mathematics. It's when you have children of mixed abilities into teams, and you start with the younger kids and you give them a number and they have to do an addition to it. And then they take that number and they give it to their teammate who then does a more complicated process of it in a more complicated way. Maybe they'll multiply it, maybe they'll, and so on. And then the team that ends up with the correct answer first wins the relay race. <clears throat> Another example of is finding a solution to the word problem in small teams rather than as individuals, and then presenting your answer to the class in the blackboard. In line with our emphasis on using the motivating element of the community in our math classes, we also hope to run annual math sports days where children make teams and they compete in a range of fun math team games the way that you would in a sports day. And if possible, we hope to run this for the other schools. That's enough said about our math class. I hope that this has given you a feeling of how we approach lessons. And now I want to tell you a few other things about what makes your school exceptional. You may be aware there is an unfortunate phenomenon in education across the Anglo-Saxon world, actually, and that boys are not performing in primary schools, secondary schools, and even in some cases up to university. This problem has been widely observed over the past 40 years or so, and it's not very well understood. It's not researched enough, if you ask me. And we don't have a perfect understanding of what it is, of why it is. But a big part of the reason is that the school environment and the teaching styles are not well adapted to how boys behave and how boys learn. I don't have time to go more into this here. And you can find out more about this problem if you're interested online. A lot of papers have been about it. But I want to say something about our attempts as a school to address this problem. If you look at our 
program which you handed out, you can see that we can work small breaks into the entire day. It's designed, our schedule is designed to allow more physical activity than what is common in schools. We work these small breaks into the day between the classes. Informally, we call this the boisterous modes, since they're intended to give children regular release from the demands of the classroom. So children can take breaks, they can be loud, they can move about, which in turn enables them to show the more attentive behavior that's expected of them during the lessons. We have P class every day, which is also not very common. It's common practice for schools to have one physical education lesson per week. These classes have been designed to promote fun, and please go online and, and look at what our physical education class consists of. They're designed to promote fun, physical and social interaction through games, physical exertion, and again, that much needed break from sitting, being calm, being quiet, and concentrating in class. We have kinesthetic learning. It worked into much of the classroom. That just means moving around and touching things. And in a way, this makes the classes more appropriate to all of the learning styles. Our classrooms are very interactive. This is, I hope you realize. We acknowledge that children are highly social beings. Our classrooms are interactive and we support group learning. We use peer work where it's appropriate. Teachers and staff are aware that it's important to maintain positive social environment where children are bringing out the best in themselves and their peers. We pay attention to showing children how to interact with others as Christians should. Now, children practice both how to cooperate and how to compete in a good spirited way. So our school is a lively place. It is a social place. It is children are part of a team, and everyone there, along with their teachers, is working together to achieve a high standard of learning. Children work together, they aim high, and they excel together. The other thing I want to talk about that's going to characterize our school is that we're aiming to have a low-tech school. Again, I won't go into this into too much detail, even though it's a controversial issue, but a lot of problems are being observed with the over-digitalization uh, of childhood. The attention span is going down, along with very many other skills that are associated to proper learning and to the activities that children need to be doing at the younger ages. There's deteriorating in emotional and psychological well-being, and there's a reduction in play, which is <laughs> very important for child development. The way we design the school is that the older children from primary five will have a computer class up to week where they're learning how to use a computer, how to write a word, how to make presentations, and all of the skills that they're going to need in order to participate in a primary high school. But in the younger years, we don't use technology unnecessarily. We don't have iPads for children to play with. Or if our teachers want to grab a song, they, they use a CD instead of a thing. We use quite a lot of books and dictionaries for looking things up. We have encyclopedia to look things up. The younger children don't have too much chronic with technology. We call this, we call our approach a return to teaching. And the reason we've called it that. It's because we find that with the use of apps, quite often what's happening is that teachers are becoming lazy and they're using the fun apps where you can score, gain points on your app to motivate the children to do the teaching for them. We're going to put a lot of emphasis on having our teachers use the dynamic of the classroom to motivate the children and use the games that we're talking about and use the social aspect of the school. We're bringing back the culture of teaching in this sense. One issue I want to bring out, which I don't know if it's a concern to anybody, but the argument generally that's being used in education today is that everyone in the school should have an iPad. It should be available to everybody from nursery school because it is an issue of equality. And the argument goes that children who are from poorer backgrounds don't have access to technology and they're not getting the learning that the other children have. The way that we understand the problem comes from other research that shows that actually in the Western world, the technology is so widespread that it is more often people from families with higher incomes who achieve a better balance between technology and real life. It, is, it tends to be families who will take their children to do other things and take them climbing and take them swimming, who are much more likely to strike that balance properly. And that it is more often the case that you see children who maybe are from single world families or whose parents don't have time to know them that they are just spending too much time and are seeing some more of No homework. This is my favorite and my son's favorite. <laughs> there are two main reasons why we don't want to have homework. The one reason is because 
our, our school program was quite intense. The children come there, they learn quite a lot, we expect quite a lot from them. We expect them to come there and put in quite a lot of effort. And in the same way that an adult wants to finish work and go home, the children want to finish their work and go home and they feel that they deserve to go home and do something else. It's also uh, very good for the, for the brain to, to rest and to do a different type of activity. To, we allow the children the freedom to contemplate what they've been learning on their own terms and to make it their own. There's no need for the homework in our school because they do enough. The other reason is because we believe in supporting family life. And a lot of parents find that by the time they get their kids home, and they feed them and they do what they need to do, the homework becomes a point of stress. The parents are stressed about it. They're doing it, the kids don't want to do it, they want to play, they don't want to see their brothers. And so it takes away these precious few hours that the families have together at the end of the day. And it, it quite often becomes a point of stress. And so we think that's unnecessary. I know this is, again, like everything in education, this is a controversial point and so many parents uh, like having homework. And for that, I want to say we actually will have some more, in the sense that we won't. But as I've said already, we learn quite a lot of things through music, and there are quite a lot of things, songs that the children need to memorize. And so we provide our friends with a CD of these songs, and you can, we invite families to listen to these at home or in the car while they're driving to sing them together and to enjoy them together. And this brings the parents with the students together over the curriculum. And also we're, in line with the classical school system where we need to have a very high quality literature available to the children, we're going to have a, a very good library with factual books as well as literature, and we encourage children voluntarily to take these books home and to enjoy them with their family. It's, I guess there's a kind of voluntary thing. This is an orthodox school, and what makes our school orthodox? And you might notice that I left this for the end. The reason I left it for the end is not because that is important, it is the most important. I've left it for the end because I wanted you to see that everything that we're doing is Christian in the school. I think that everything I've said so far is Christian. And why is that? Because we're aiming at excellence. We're aiming at bringing, looking at beauty, looking at the good in the world, imitating it, and doing that in an excellent way. And it is, it was Christ after all who said, be perfect and do everything to the glory of God. And so we're teaching our children to do that, and we believe that a Christian school is always striving for that sort of thing. We don't have this theology class, but we teach theology practically. So the first thing that you see from our program is that children in the school are living a life of prayer. We pray in the morning, we pray at the end of the day, and we pray for our meals. We will be attending the liturgy, doing, as Benedetta said, doing the major feasts, where it's possible for us to do that. And we're hoping that our bishop will be regularly visiting the school, as well as our other clergy, and our students will have the opportunity to be in dialogue with them and ask them questions about the faith. And we're also hoping that other people from Christian communities will visit us as guest speakers, and the children will have an opportunity to go to them, speak with them. And of course, the Friday class, if you look at your schedule, the Friday is entirely dedicated, with the exception of the art class, to learn about the lives of the saints. It is one of the board show um, where we study the lives of particular saints that are on the calendar. Those days, one or two saints, we give a particular emphasis to the saints in the British Isles so that children can get to know the place we live. But we're not restricted to that. First, the children hear the story of the life of the saint. And, and then they tell the story back through theater. So they make up their own little play about what they've learned, and they, they tell the story back, and that way they learn it better. And you might be surprised, or if you have kids, you might not have parents to know, the children particularly love the martyr, and yes, they love to be the bad guy with the sword who's going to chop your head off. And then we, we have some sort of craft or, or artwork, which is, again, themed on the lens. It's in this process, and they're getting to know about the calendar. One last thing. As I said earlier, there are quite a lot of other small Christian schools that are popping up here and there. We're in consultation with some of them. We're trying to learn from their experience. We're looking forward soon to a conversation with St. Cyprian in London, 
There's another Christian school in Edinburgh, a partisan school called Manfields, which is an excellent school. And we're hoping to cooperate with them. We're very grateful to them. They've already shown quite a lot of generosity in cooperating with us. They're excited about our project. We hope to be working with them and learning from them. And we've already discussed the pen pal exchange with a school. It's called the Mount Tabor School of Literary Arts in Missouri. We've been in close contact with the Garden Angel Orthodox Day School in Illinois, and we hope that we will be able to network with quite a lot of schools and make our community, our learning community, even better and support each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.